So some of you have already been working on this a little bit, finding out how to factor based on, I heard some of you working with Mr. Kwan, some of you I've chatted with a bit. So today I want to go through and do a really thorough job of explaining what factoring looks like. Everybody ready? Right, can I get your focus, guys? Okay. You know how we've been talking about operations on math for the last while? Add, subtract. Well, add and subtract, they're opposites of each other, aren't they? Multiply, divide. They're opposites of each other. Uh, almost every operation that I can think of in math has some sort of counter operation. Squaring is countered by square rooting. Um, Exponentials are contracted by logarithms, which granted you probably don't even know those words because that's your third grade 12 curriculum, but everything has an opposite. Well, the operation you guys were just doing was basically we call it expanding or distributing, but there is an opposite to that, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. It's called factoring. It's, it's the opposite. What we're going to do is we're going to take something that has been foiled out, and we're going to turn it back into the product of binomials. So rather than actually foiling, like normally we foil this out and we get this as an answer, we're going to go the other way this time. And this is one of the most fundamental skills that I need you to pick up on in grade 10, because it's so critical to grade 11 and grade 12 math. So make sure I'm really clear on this. If you do not understand what we're doing, you're not going to be able to move forward next year or the year after that. This is such a vital piece of information if you like the Jenga analogy. This isn't just one piece that's missing. This is like a whole row out of the tower. Okay. So we got to make sure that even if you make some mistakes once in a while where you go 2 times 3 is 5 and you go, whoops, I need you to understand this process. So we're going to spend a lot of time on it. Like We're going to spend the next three weeks, basically, learning how to do the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, your next assignment is very boring. It's basically lots and lots of the exact same question. Because that's kind of how you need to learn sometimes. You just need to do rep repetition. So, so here's some more uh, some thoughts on this. Uh, polynomials is really what we're working with. Uh, polynomials typically fit this format. I've never shown you this before, I don't think. So let's walk through what, what makes this a polynomial in standard form. You have a certain number of x's. Like say you have three x's to the seventh. I'm just making up numbers here. Well, then maybe you have 2x. This n minus 1 just means that whatever this number is, you have 1 less than it. So rather than being to the 7, it would now be to the 6. Let's say you don't have any x to the 5s, or x to the 4s, or x to the 3s. Well, you can still write that. It means you have 0x to the 5s, and maybe you have 0x to the 4s. And you keep doing this until you finally get to the spot where you have no x's. You don't even bother writing an x. We call this thing a constant term. So like say plus 7. If it can be written as a polynomial, there's a very good chance it can be factored. That's our goal over the next, well, this unit. But we, we expand on this in the next couple of years. We need to learn how to basically unfactor these things so they're no longer in standard form. Here's the concept. You guys should know how to expand. If I go x times x, x times minus 1, minus 4, there's a 4x, there's a minus 1x. So far, you guys have gone this way. My job for the next couple of weeks here is to make sure you're great. I'm going backwards. Stress me something. Before I get to my example, uh, as a way to try to help organize things in your mind, I like to break things up into four different types of factors. Um, so I'm going to try to teach you some stages. So there's what I call the common factor. Then there's what I call the simple trinomial. What makes something a trinomial? Three terms, right? You guys can see how this one here has three terms. Uh, this one I call the complex trinomial. Just so you're aware of how the difference between the two. This one right here, the number in front of x squared is 1. That makes things nice and simple. Here there's number 3 in front. That buggers things up like crazy. These ones are much harder. 
And then the last one is the difference of squares. Today, I'm going to show you these two. So we're going to learn how to factor these two. Either next week, or if we can push it up to this week, then I'll show you how to do the other two. We'll do it in stages. Sound good? So there's our roadmap. Let's do some examples. Our goal is to take this polynomial and turn it back into things that are in brackets. That's our goal. We want to refine the factors. So the first strategy is basically find what's in common. Look at the numbers here, 3 and 6. Don't 3 and 6 kind of have something similar between them? Isn't 6 really 3 times 2? There is therefore a 3 in both of these numbers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out a 3 outside of a bracket. That's the first step. I say there is a 3 in both of these values. I put 3 outside. Hopefully you'd agree though, there's more than just a 3 in both of these. This guy has two x's side by side. This guy also has an x. So both of these numbers have an x. What we now need to do is kind of reverse engineer and figure out, well, what would this times by to get to this right here? So in this location right here, 3x, what would I have to times by to get to 3x squared? That's just x. Let's talk through y. Can I put a 1 in front of it? It doesn't change it, right? Wouldn't 3 times 1 give me the 3 I need? And wouldn't this x? Times that x right there, give me the x squared. Mm -hmm. awesome. Well, now I need the plus sign. You know how this plus sign is right here? It needs to be carried out. Then I need another term sitting here. So I need to kind of reverse engineer this in my mind and figure out, well, 3 times what would get me up to 6? And the answer is 3 times 2 would get me up to 6. So then I kind of work backwards and say, well, 3 times 2 is 6. There's an x right here. Should I put another x inside here? Well, no, because if I did put another x inside there, it would give me x and x for x squared. I don't want another one, so we're actually done. The final answer to this would be 3x next to x plus 2. Essentially, what I've done is I've undistributed. The word we use, though, rather than saying undistributed or unexpand, we use the word factor. The reason why they're factors is that really this is timesing, like these two things are being multiplied by each other. Remember how we made factor trees in the last unit, where you go like say 48 is 4 times 12? Right. Well, 4 times 12 is 48. That's really the same sort of thing. Let's try another example. Whew. I give up. There's multiple variables right off the bat. Well, Take it piece by piece. Start with your number numbers. 7, 28, and 14. Are all those numbers, is there like a common factor between all of them? Yeah, they all have a 7, don't they? So I think all of these can involve 7. What about our letters? This one has at least 1a. This one has only 1a. And this one here has also only 1a. But would you guys agree that at minimum all three of these terms have at least an A? Yeah. So I could factor it out. I'm going to put a bracket here in a second. And I think the same logic applies to the Bs. There's at least one B here. This one also has a B. This one has B squared. That's okay. okay. But do they all have bare minimum at least one? We're, sometimes I use the word like we're going to take it out. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm trying to take this out of the remaining pieces here. It's what's been what I put factored. See how there's three terms right here? On the inside, we're also going to need one, two, three terms. So now I have to reverse engineer and kind of work backwards and figure out well, what would get us to that point. I need a seven right here. I pulled the seven out. What number should go inside then? Uh, well, I was actually going to say the number one. Because 7 times 1 is 7. Often we skip that number, but it's really important sometimes to write it down. Um, but you guys are ahead of me. You need an A, right? Because if you do A times A, you get the A squared. And the B, I don't need another one. I'm going to go. Right, see how there's a minus sign right here? I'm going to need a minus sign right 
Here. 7 is going to need to have times then by a number number right here to make it 28. 7 times blank equals 28. Okay, well now for our letters. I need to have an A and a B. But the A and the B are already right outside here, aren't they? So in a way, do I need any more A's and B's? Well, no, that would, that would mess it up, right? So I think I'm, I'm good, but I just want the number four sitting there. All right, lastly, there's a plus sign here, so I'll put plus sign between there. Seven would need to times by a number here that makes it a 14. So two. Well, I need one A. Oh, there's one already right there. I need B squared. So if there's one here, there's one more for the B squared. Yeah, here I can. Yeah. Well, uh, I can close it up and sound perfect. If I can find where I left the little two for it. Uh, two examples in. Does this kind of make sense to Yeah. So uh, maybe if I clean this up a little bit, I'd write it like this then. 7AB is on the outside of a trinomial of A, I won't write the 1, plus 2B minus 4. The only reason why I change the order up a little bit is that standard convention for standard form is that you start with your highest exponents. And since Ooh. this is to the 1 and that's to the 1, it doesn't really matter which one of these goes first. But in standard form, the constant term, generally, well, that's what we call it that, right? General form, it goes last. So Now, if you left it at this part right here, I wouldn't mark it wrong. It's just this is this is the normal convention to write it like this. You probably don't write bother writing all those ones right there, though. That's OK. What about here? Well, we do the exact same thing. Let's look for anything that's in common. Is there a number in all of the number numbers here? A 1, an 8, a 2, and a 16? 1. Yeah, that's two. it. 1. Oh. Not 2, right? I because know I said two. there's a 1 right there, and it doesn't, it doesn't have a 2. So in a way, the best thing I can do is factor out a 1. What about some of our letters? Y. Yeah, don't all of them have at least a Y somewhere? This one has a Y. That one has a Y, that one has a Y, that one has a Y. If I can factor out a Y. How many terms then should be left inside this bracket? Three. Four. 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 Right? Because there's one, two, three, four. Okay. So now we have to work backwards. And, and the more you do this, the better you get. Where you say, well, how do I make a Y squared if there's a Y out front? I, just, I need a Y. How do I make an 8xy if the y has been pulled out front? 8x. Well, yeah, if the y is out front, so I just need the 8x. I don't know right. yeah. Well, now we need a 2y, but the y is just sitting out front. Two. All I need is the number 2. two. Three. And then for this one right here, the 16. 16. We need a 16. Y yeah, some of you are way ahead of me already, aren't you? Because mm -hmm. y times y squared would get you the y. There's only one more thing I think I'd recommend we do. We should write it from highest to lowest exponents. So I'd say y. And then the highest exponent is like the 16y squared. Are you ever going to mark it wrong if it's in the wrong order? No, but it, it's a good practice to get used to what is considered practice. standard. Yeah. I mean, we're on a multi-year journey here. It's, let's form good habits here in grade 10 so that you don't have to change your bad habits in grade 11 or 12. Uh, then I probably would put the y next. Uh, the 8x, though, like both of these two things have the same degree, so it doesn't actually matter which one is next. And then I put the 2 last. It's just it's, it's nice to kind of write it in that order. That's very conventional. One of the nice things about learning how to factor is you can always check your work. It doesn't usually take long to check your work. You go y times 16y squared. Oh, yeah, that's your 16y over 3. y times y, y squared. Y times 8x, 8xy. Y times 2, 2y. Like it usually doesn't take more than a few seconds to check what you're doing. 
That's called a common factor. Basically, find something that's common amongst all of the terms, and the phrasing I'll use is factor it out. Basically, pull it to the outside of a bracket. Okay. Are you okay? Whoever yeah. <laughs> 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 listens to the videos afterwards must sometimes get entertained by it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, oh yeah. yeah the funny things that happen in class. <laughs> okay. So this one right here is the next one I want to try. <laughs> this one's a bit of a challenge here. Because in a way there's already something in brackets. So I want to show you two methods of how you could solve this. What you could do, don't write this one down by the way, just watch, but don't write this one because this is the long way. This is not going to be as useful. You could go 3 times x for 3x squared. You could go 3 times minus 4 for minus 12x. You could go 5 times x for 5x. 5 times minus 4 for minus 20. And by the time you're done, you're left with 3x squared. Minus, yeah, my brain's not working, 7x minus 20. Now hang on a sec. This is the opposite of what we're looking for. Because this is in a standard form, and I need to break this up into two things that are bracketed like that. So I, I say this a lot to groups. You're not wrong, but this wasn't helpful. This is correct. You haven't done anything mathematically error wise. But if our goal is to get a product of two binomials, does this help me get towards my goal? So I've picked this one on purpose to illustrate a different concept. We're still working with common factors. There is actually something in common. The x minus 4 is actually in common. In a way, this is kind of a term right here. And this right here is kind of a term. What if I wrote it differently? What if I didn't write it as x minus 4? What, this maybe seems silly, but what if I wrote it as 3x, smiley face, plus 5, smiley face? Rather than writing an x minus 4, what if I just replaced it with something different? Would you guys agree that each of these two things here has a smiley face or an x minus 4 as part of it? So let's factor that out. Let me do it with smiley face. There is a smiley face in both of these terms. That's the only thing in common. So working backwards, 3x better go here, right? Because 3x times by smiley face will give me this. And uh, if I pull the smiley face out of the 5, I just need a plus 5. Oh, yeah, sorry. This was, uh, this was kind of where it started. This is the right way to do it. Are we writing the smiley faces? Or well, uh, let me show you two different ways then. So the last thing you could do then is say, well, hang on, smiley face is not actually a mathematical term we're using, right? What did smiley face represent then? It represented an x minus 4. Now, do I have a product of binomials? Because I'm just I'm making smiley face into x minus 4. If you can see how that works, you might even be able to go to this right off the bat and say, both of these terms right here, they have an x minus 4 in common. So I'm going to factor out the entire bracket at x minus 4. And it leaves me with here a 3x. And here a plus 5. And now it's factored. Remember how a while back ago I had like 3x squared plus 7x minus 20 or something like that? This is actually what it would have turned into. It's just this is kind of challenging to do. Sometimes the thing in common is not just a letter or just a number. Sometimes the thing in common is an entire binomial term. Let me just go over that. So how about this one? What is in common numbers-wise? A one, I think. Well, this time Haley says two. You see why it's not a two, right? Because yeah. the first one. Okay. Yeah. Do all of them have an A? Nope. Shoot, the last one doesn't. Do all of them have a B? Nope. So you might get to a spot here where you look at a question like this and say, hang on, I don't think anything is in common. Well, we can actually play a really nifty trick here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to separate these into P 
pieces. I'm just going to look at just these first two terms here. Is there something in common between the a squared and the a b? To the degree that they both have an a. So this would then be a plus 8b. With a new color, I'm going to work over here with these next ones here. Is there anything letters-wise in common between the A and the B? No. no not. But numbers-wise, there's a 2 in both of them, isn't there? Well, that would be with A plus 16 divided by 2 is your 8. Even though it didn't look like these things could be factored, actually, they can be. Because here's why. The 8 plus AB, you can see how there's, there's two of them there, right? It's in common. So it becomes 8 plus AB, A plus 8B. And then the stuff that it was factored out from is the A plus A. Yeah. This is now the product of two diamonds. I want to check our work. Just make sure we did it right. Because this shouldn't take long. A times A. A squared. 8B times A will give you 8AB. Uh, A times 2 give you 2A. And the one I missed would be this one here. 8B times 2 will be 16 b Yeah. Okay, cool, right? What we're going to do is we're going to keep working on these skills as we basically, as we build our Jenga tower, slightly taller, slightly taller. We'll add new skills so that when it looks like maybe it can't be solved, I'll point out, hey, what about this ability? So all of these, though, they have something in common, being that they all had a common factor. There was something that each thing had that you could, like, pull out. This one actually had twice, though. In a way, you had to do the first half what was common, the second half what was common, and then from what you got there, the same thing that was left over was also in common. So it was like a triple common factor. You had the common factor of this, one. Common factor of this, two. Common factor of this, that eventually we got to our spot. Maybe you can even kind of see why I described our assignment as being very repetitive. This is the sort of thing where it's not, it's not exciting or sexy math, but like, <laughs> but we need to, uh, I need you guys to do a lot of practice on this, right? The more practice you do, the better you get. So your assignment is basically, there's basically a whole bunch of just factor this, factor this, factor this. And it's not a lot of variety, but it's, it's important that you guys get that practice in. Okay, second set here. <coughs> Once you get the, the hang of how to do it, a common factor. You can then use those skills to factor what's called a simple trinomial. Okay, so this is the next set of ones I want to do. These are trinomials because there's three terms, right? Are any of the terms like terms? Could we put any of them together? No, they're all different. And that's actually a major issue for us so far because there is nothing in common whatsoever. I mean, other than the number one. Numbers wise, you have a one, a two, and a three. The only thing the same there is a one. Uh, one's an x squared, one's an x, but since the last one does not have an x, we're kind of stumped. So what we want to do here, actually, is we want to split this middle term up into some pieces so that we can do what we just did on the last slide here. I want to show you something. Let's say that I wrote it like this, x squared plus x plus 2x plus 2. Isn't 3x the same thing as x plus 2x? Wouldn't that give you 3x? Let's suppose that we just we did that. And I'll explain how we do that in a second here. But if you can agree with me that this is mathematically equal, just watch. I'm just gonna I'm only, I won't even speak all out. I'm just gonna do the exact same thing I did before. X in common here. See how when I factored these pieces out here. You want to get your tall table cut down? I don't want to cut it off. Thank you. 
see how in this section right here, there's an x in both of them? So if I pull the x out, I'm left with x plus 1. But over here on the other section, there is a 2 in common. So I pull the 2 out. But this is what we just encountered in the last example. There is an x plus 1 on both of these halves here. So I'm then going to factor out the x plus 1. And the leftover bit will be the x plus 2 from here to here. This is considered factor. I'm going to do quite a few examples. Like Sometimes we just have to do a lot of examples. But let me prove to you why this works. x times x is x squared x times 2 is 2x, two 1 times x is 1x, and 1 times 2 is 2. If I put these like terms together, I get 3x. Here's the issue then. How do I figure out how to split that middle term up? That's what kids struggle with then is, well, if I can agree that I need to take the middle term and split it up into two different sets of like terms, how do I know how to split the 3 of x? I mean, 3 is pretty logical. It's 1 and 2 is 3. But what if the middle term was 5x? Well, you could go 2x and 3x. Or you could go 4x and 1x. Or you could go minus 8x and plus 13x. So the question is, how do you know what to split those middle terms into pieces? So I want to show you a little bit of a rule. And some of you might have seen this before from another teacher. In order to figure out what sort of numbers you want to split this middle term into pieces of, you're looking for a combination. And I write it out like this. You're looking for two numbers that add to give a certain value, and you're looking for two numbers that multiply to give a certain value. The number that it needs to add to is always the middle number. So in this example, it's 3. And that maybe makes sense, because this 1 and this 2, they better add up to give 3. But there's lots of numbers that add to 3. 1 and 2, 0 and 3, negative 1 and 4, negative 2 and 5. So the other half of it is we need numbers that times, and they need to multiply to give the very last number, which is 2. So now it's a bit of a puzzle. Can you think of any numbers that would add to give 3, that would also multiply to give 2? You kind of already know the answer, right? Because the answer is 1 and 2. Yeah. Which then told me how to break the middle term up. Now that kind of, in a piecewise manner, right? this is not the order you normally solve the problem, but I've kind of showed you the pieces of it. Let's try another example. By the way, of all this work on here, where is the step where I am done? This one right here. Okay. This is called factors, because you have a bracket next to another bracket. Okay. So even though I kind of re-expanded it down here, this is the step we're looking for. So let's try another example. And the more you do these, the better you get. So we have x squared, 8x, and 12. And right off the bat, there is nothing in common other than the number 1. No, not all three of the terms contain the letter x. Uh, 8 and 12, they have a 4 in them, but the 1 doesn't. So what we're going to do is we're going to split this 8 up into a couple of different numbers. It's going to go 8x squared, and I need to find two numbers that still add to get 8. But there's so many numbers that add to get 8. It could be 1 and 7, 2 and 6, 3 and 5, 4 and 4. How will I know which combination to use? Added together, they have to equal 12. Added together, they have to equal 8. Multiplied together, they have to equal 12. This is the little key. So I always write this up in the corner. Yes. Uh, here's how I recommend to solve this. I, I work with numbers of times to give 12. Because there's not a lot of stuff with times to give 12. 1 and 12, 6 and 2, 3 and 4. Well, 1 and 12 are not going to add to give 8. 3 and 4 actually add to give 7, but 6 and 2, that works. Once you figure that out, that is what tells you how to split the 8. So the 8 is actually consisting of a 6 and a 2. And truth be told, it does not matter which one goes first. Um, I'm going to put the 6 first just because. Okay. 
maybe some colors now. For the first two terms, what's common? X. There's only an X. Because of that, the leftover bit will be an X plus X. And again, the more you do this, the faster your brain kind of recognizes the patterns. For the second two terms, 2x and 12. There's not an x in common, right? but 2 and 12 are both divisible by 2. So if you factor out a 2, work backwards. You have to have an x here. 2 times what gives you 12? 2 times 6 gives you 12. I'm going to pause here for a second. You will know at this point right here whether you're right or not if the thing in brackets is the same. If it's not the same, you messed up. Okay? Which is kind of nice though, because you'll know when you do it right or wrong. At this point here, you should know I was doing it right, because I got the x plus 6 in brackets. So our last step, the x plus 6 is actually now kind of something in common. So x plus 6 can be factored out. The leftover bit will be this x and this plus 2. Let's check our work real quick. I don't have to do it all. x times x, x squared. 6 and x will give you 6x. X. x and 2 will give you 2x. Two, 2 and 6 is... Eight, like I thought it would be. Six times two? Is this factored? Well, do I have the product of two bracketed binomials? Yeah, I think That makes sense? I'm going to show you a shortcut. After kids have done this for a while, they pick up on things and they go, hang on, this number here was six and this number here was two. This number was six and this was two. Uh, this one was six and this one was two. Is there something to that? Actually, there is. Go back an example. Here my numbers were 1 and 2, and 1 and 2, and 1 and 2. After a while, you actually don't need to show me all the work. Now, it's not mathematically valid to just hop from one to the next, but after you figure out the pattern for a while, there is basically a rule that says if you can find these numbers up in the corner, you can actually skip and go right to the final answer. I want to try that on the next example, and then we'll just confirm that it's right. Let's do another one. We need to do x squared plus 3x plus 2. First we know what we need to do is find numbers that would add and multiply. It needs to add to give the middle set of numbers. So the middle number is the 3, and it's to multiply to give 2. And some kids, they're just they're good at this game. 1 and 2. 1 and 2, yeah. But if you're really stumped, as to how to solve this, I always look at the times a number. Well, actually, the only thing that times is going to be 2 is 1 and 2. So, 1 and 2. Hey, look, it equals 3. Good news. If you want to, you could skip all of the following steps and go right down to this. x plus 1, for this one right here, and uh, x plus 2, for this 2 right here. If you want to, you can just hop right down there once you get it. Technically, that's not mathematically valid to just magically do that. So I want to make sure everyone understands why we were allowed to do that. Here's, here's the show again. Let's read it. So what I just wrote in there is proving why it works. But once you get the hang of how this was, it's actually not that hard. You can just find these numbers and it hop right to the final answer. Does that make sense? What else are we got? So we need numbers that add and multiply. So we need to add to give the 12 and multiply to give the 27. So I recommend dealing with the 27 
There's not a lot of stuff that multiplies to get 27. 1 and 27, that has to get 28, that's not good. 3 and 9, 3 and 9 has to get 12. So once you get the hang of it, 3 and 9, 3 and 9, if you want to, you can just go right to the final answer. x plus 3, x plus 9. Okay. Mathematically, okay, that's not how that works, right? But if you get all the steps that go along there, I'm cool if you guys just skip all these steps over here. Let me say some math. Double check. x times x is x squared. That's 3x. That's 9x. 9 and 3 is 12. 3 and 9? And so. Is that my last example? Okay, I just realized that I should give you one more. Because the one thing I did not do is make any of these values negative. So can you guys throw in one more example from the bottom of the slide? Let's do a negative one. Let's try this one. So you can deal with negative numbers still. Negative numbers work. So the same principle still applies. We need to find two numbers that add but now we need them to add to give negative 5. That negative is part of this. So we need numbers that add to give negative 5. And we need numbers that multiply to give not just 6, but see there's a negative in front of it? Just multiply to give negative 6. Let's try that. So Chelsea suggests negative 2 and 3. So I'm just going to write these out. We'll make sure it works. Well, 2 and 3, they multiply to negative. Okay, well, let's try it. So if I did negative 2 and negative 3, it's negative 5, right? Yeah. Oh. Right? Mi minus 2 plus yeah. minus 3 is minus 5. But here's the problem, though. Is minus 2 times minus 3 minus 6? Uh -oh. Plus 6. Okay, so then I think you suggested let's make one of them, like, say, positive. That doesn't work for this guy right here. A 5 and 6 combo is actually one of the harder ones. It's not a 2 and a 3 always. So let's talk about numbers that times to get 6. There is 2 and 3, but there's also 1 and Let's try 1 and 6. Now, if I just leave them both as positive, 1 and 6 is not a negative, right? So, 1 and 6. One of them has to be negative, right? Is, should I make it negative 1 or negative 6 to make it a minus 5? Right? Well, no, it does, right? Because if I make it the negative 1, negative 1 plus 6 is plus 5. Does that mean that? So we're going to have to make it a positive 1 and a negative 6. So that'll make it equal to negative 5. And a positive 1 and a negative 6 will make equal negative 6. So it is very important when you're dealing with negative numbers to make sure that you get them straight as to which one goes what. The good news is, though, using the little trick we've learned, I know what the answer is. You're going to have two binomials. Say so you have a plus 1. Well, that makes it x plus 1. We haven't done a negative 1 yet, but if we use a negative, it's minus 6. It just means that it's x minus 6. That's all. Let's, uh, let's just do a quick FOIL to make sure we did it right. x times x is x squared. Uh, x times minus 6 is minus 6x. Six There's a plus 1x. Isn't minus 6 and plus 1 minus 5? Um, what did I miss? Minus 1 times minus 6 is minus 6. It looks like everything's there. In a way, this is a good way of illustrating how they're opposite to each other x squared minus 5x minus 6 could have broken up into minus 1x minus 6x minus 6, x minus 1, x, that's a plus there, x minus 1, x minus 1, x plus 6. If you go this way, this is known as factoring. If you go this way, it's known as expanding or distributing. These are some of the basics. We're, we're not there yet. Like I've only shown you a few of the starting ones, right? But this is the concept. Can you go from a standard form to two binomials, and vice versa? Can you go from the binomials back to the standard form? That makes sense so far. Okay, last thought, and then I'll shut up for the day. No, I'm talking. I've only actually shown you two of the things I need to. So we've covered how to do a common factor and a simple trend. 
Do you guys feel like it'd be okay to try this sometime later this week? Maybe on Thursday? Yes. Time wise, it's not going to be a major issue. Okay. We'll try it Thursday if it works. Um, we need to learn what to do when there is a number in front here of a three. It buggers things up like crazy. Because look at this one right here. If I look for numbers that add to give seven and multiply to give two, seven and two coming from here and here, uh, the only things that times to give two are one and two. And that won't add to give seven. And yet, this is actually possible to turn it into two by binomials. So I need to show you another method. Uh, and this last one here, it doesn't even have a middle number. Like there is no x sitting in the middle. So I need to show you a technique for that one as well. But this is kind of the basics of where we work. This is, if, if there's anything that you need to learn from 10C going forward, this is it. Um, not all outcomes and tests are created equal. Even though we kind of like weight them all kind of roughly the same, um, to me this unit is probably the most important. I, I teach the dash one and dash two classes in grade 11 and grade 12. And I would say that the reason why kids struggle in grade 11 and grade 12 can be traced right back to this unit here. I have a whole class of kids in grade 11 right now, and they're really separated into two groups. There's the kids who know how to factor, and they're good at it, and they're able to take off. And there's the kids who really never learned how to factor very well in grade 10, and they're struggling in grade 11, and probably going to struggle in grade 12, because really... It wasn't supposed to. Like, literally, you're missing a whole world, though, okay? It really is that critical. So, I know we're running out of time today. There's not much left to do. So, a quick reminder of tasks. Try to finish the first assignment. The second assignment is ready to go as well. Okay, so we have a couple days to work on it. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. I'll pause the recording here. So we'll try to do that lesson Thursday if everyone feels that that's reasonable.